Thank you for joining the Once Changing the World, India's first Future Tech Meet Sustainability podcast. And today, I'm delighted and honored to have with me Mr. Takashi Ikigam, who is a professor in the yes. Department of General System Science, Graduate School of Arts and Sciences at the University of Tokyo. He has a PhD in physics. His research focuses on complex systems and artificial life, a field uh-huh. that aims to build new forms of life systems using computer simulations. chemical experiments and robots mm. he heads the ikigami laboratory and is also the founder of alternative machine where he started several experimental and conceptual works using an android called alter 3 and other biochemical experiments so professor really appreciate you taking time being part of our humble podcast can you start with explaining the difference between artificial intelligence and what you uh, the subject that you're forefronting artificial life artificial intelligence is to optimize something so that you always have a uh, objectives to optimize but for artificial life this is more like uh, what is it it's starting from the question answering to the question what is life what the origin of life is so that's a big difference so we don't have any you know optimization processes or anything but so that the art, artificial li- intelligence is it's, it's a rather It's kind of a side effect of artificial intelligence. I think we have to make life first, and then the intelligence follows uh, the life processes. So when you're talking about artificial life, obviously there's a biologist at the forefront trying to synthesize life with the DNA and RNA, and you know there are mm-hmm. there are various various people around the world who are who are kind of like tinkering around with that, and and, and you have taken like a, a three step process. You know, first you try to kind of tinker around, build artificial life in computer simulations, then you started uh, uh, actually tinkering on the wet code of life, which is you know the chemical experiments with DNA. and then now you're using alter 3 the, the 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 robot the humanoid robot yeah. so amongst all of the three which area do you find most promising in creating uh, artificial life and that's a very interesting question um let me see for the moment i think because of a large language model uh android or robot is very promising um and then, then the second thing is a uh, chemical experiment that is uh, different from our uh, uh, you know standard computer systems so that i'm have some you know a uh, big expectation for that right so so you mentioned about the first being uh uh the these silicon based life you know the, these yeah. humanoid robots and there are peers around the world i mean your peers like uh tesla who's building optimus then there's uh engineered arts which is building uh, mk the robots there's uh hansen robots who's who's yeah, doing yeah. uh sofia and there's many others and then you built uh alter 3 could could you could you talk about uh the process the the hardware and the software uh behind alter 3 yes um before going that direction i have to say that you know um for example like mathematics the simple calculation is you can do it with uh, with 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 a large computer but also with with pencils and paper also with your fingers right so uh mathematics is something completely different from uh, uh which tools or materials that you are using right it's independent from them so uh life may be something like that if you look into fingers or you know checkerboard or you know computer you cannot find what the mathematics is mathematics is just implemented in those computers or tools or fingers but it's not what mathematics is about right and that's what i call software so this kind of software that may exist and um, living systems is, is also you know maybe it is not depending on cells and dna and so far maybe it's more it's like a mathematics that it can choose any kinds of materials but once you can you know uh, wisely combine them together then you can make a uh, living systems without using cells and dna so artificial life is all about what is the replacement that is possible replacement is a lower layer you know uh, components can be replaced with something else 
That's what I call uh, artificial life. Right. So, so you're a physicist. And life, I, I think it's very complex. You know, I mean, there are, I mean, there is, you know, people who have got a definition of life. Mm-hmm. But then, I mean, you know, when you're talking about new life, it's it's like, I mean, we don't have a clue at this point in time. You know, there are people at the forefront, you know, like, I mean, uh, Michael Levin at Tufts uh, Laboratory and others who are kind of tinkering around and kind of figuring out what could be that new form of life. Could, could, could you kind of like explain the, the core of life, you know, I mean, because biologically, you know, I mean, we are just four, uh, you know, four chemicals, A, C, T, G. Uh, could, could, could you kind of explain life and what's your inkling or an idea when you're talking about chemically experimenting and creating life? Um, um, what's the idea? How do we, you yeah. know, because life is extremely complex. It's dynamic. It's emergent. You know, how, 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 how do we... I think the life is more about, you know, uh, creation of information, cre- creation of new information within a system. That's the very big, but it does a definition of, of, our, of, of living systems, right? But when you can make a chemical, and then if you can generate uh, new kinds of chemical uh, structures on top of it, right, without designing it, then we can, we want to call it um, uh, chemical systems. I mean, the living systems. So it's a starting of a living system. That's what I call um, uh, life but you know um for for my program i mean so think about this is a new kind of experiment once you have a dna i mean the egg cell and then like plant cell within a box within a, a cup right but this one is sealed and then it's a it's a closed closed bin but there's a sunlight is coming from outside right so and then put the water in it so if it's 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 a regularly uh, working, then from the egg uh, from the fish egg, the fish comes out. From the plant egg, plant cell, the plant is coming up, right? So that the plants and then fish can make a small ecological systems, so that they can provide oxygen. You have a sunlight. You have a, a metabolic cycle is going on, so that you can sustain this small fish and plant ecological systems, right? But without, without any, uh, the same energy and uh, same entropy, you can change the orders of the sequence of DNA sequences within a plant cell and the fish egg. So from there, you cannot make anything. Energy, energetically, this is completely the same. Chemically-wise, this is the same. However, because the, the order of the symbols, I mean, the DNA sequences is different from the the regular fish cell and then plant cell, so that you cannot, you cannot, um, so that you cannot um, generate uh, fish and egg, uh, the fish and plant from them, so that there is no ecological eco, eco, ecological system is, is generating emerging from it, right? So, what's the difference between the things that generated a plant and fish ecological systems and this one that just generating a tar or just you know uh, just nothing the difference is only the sequential combination between the regulatory dna and the thing, things that we just artificially made right so i think that's why people are saying maybe the life is about the information you really have to you know uh, prepare information very carefully so that you can generate a uh, living system from, from it. So I think it's something to do with the uh, information and then information that generates new kind of information. That's my definition of life. Right. You know, there's Max Tegmark who says the universe is math- mathematics. There's Seth Lloyd who says uh, mm-hmm. the universe is, is, is a quantum uh, computer. And at the subatomic level, you know, I mean, you know, the physics and chemicals is going bonkers, mm-hmm. you know, because mm-hmm. uh, there is uh, the, these particles who have got, uh, who manifest into waves and, and there are these, uh, the, these particles, they can self-assemble and stuff like that. Yes. <laughs> What's your 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 intuition on you know building these life, which is uh, rep, self replicating, learning in in the chemical space? I mean, what's your intuition? I mean, how- so, so, so that's what I'm saying. You know, if this one is just aggregating the particles and then making a big particles and self organization is something that sometimes people think it's living systems. But the self-organization is sometimes it's 
you know, uh, in de decreasing information from the beginning, right? From, from the beginning, there are a bunch of particles, but once they're aggregating together, they are losing degrees of freedom. So you can tell what's going on there, right? But the living system is, is even starting from the particles, the uh, sort of uh, complexity is, complexity can be found in the combination of the particles, right? So the complex, complexity rather increasing from the beginning, comparing with the beginning, right? So if you can replace complexity by information, information is always increasing by the time going goes on. But uh, non-living physical systems or chemical systems is always going to losing the complexity. Maybe the entropy goes up, but the complexity is going down so that you can you can ex describe the, the end output uh, states by more uh, simple words and you don't have to describe them in with, with different you know uh, different words or different phrases because it's becoming very simple, right? So the, the so the end state or the state that is that what you can expect is getting more complex and complex compared with the with the beginning or initial state. That's what we think it's a living system. It's a big difference. Right. right. So, so, so the evolution is taking place. That's right. Amazing. So, so you know, there are these like I, I was alluding to uh, Michael Eleven from Tufts Lab, and I, I think he he's the one who's like like really kind of tinkering around with uh, you know bioelectrics. And uh, earlier, I think he had used a frog skin to create what they call the world's first living AI robots that can also reproduce. And then I think recently they took this human lung cells and created what they term as anthrobots, which moves on their own and also heals wounds. Who, who are the other hmm. peers around the world who are in this direction of building artificial life, who have created these proof of concepts, at least, you know, I mean, like the, the first building blocks of what they could call, you know, term artificial life. Are there a, anybody else besides you who are building, you know, in the artificial well, life? For example, like uh, Michael Levin uh, using a Xenopus cell uh, to create a um, uh, uh, robot from, from the Xenopus cell, which I think is great. But we also, you know, uh, like almost 20 years ago, that uh, Professor Asashima, he was on the uh, f f sixth floor from, from my uh, my office, and he was using uh, Activin. Activin is a small chemical, but, you know, en enzymes that using Activin, um, then changing the amount of Activin that you can generate different um, organs, like uh, directly from the... Uh, from the initial cell to make a heart cell or brain cell or, you know, uh, kidney or anything by just changing the, the amount of activin and the time that you, you, you are using those activins, you know, during you are putting those uh, enzymes into the cells. So that's, uh, that's everything that started. So Michael Levin's experiment is great, but also... Uh, Professor Asashima and other group also have been uh, have found the, that kind of phenomena. But the interesting point is, if you want to combine them together to make a, a complete individuals, right? And I was, still, this is not possible. It's very interesting that if you make a heart cell and put into this incubator, right? And then after three days, four days, this uh, synthesized uh, heart will die. They cannot survive, but once you put the heart cell in other animals, other individuals, right? They already had a heart, but put the heart next to it or something. So this individual now has two hearts, but this heart is now they don't die within three days. They can survive for like uh, life lifelong. So what's the difference between this and this? Uh, we still don't know this. Well, we can call it totality or something else individual uh, you know structure or something but the one thing that we know is living system is not a lego block you cannot just combine them together it's not a, it's not a lego block right if it's a, if the living system is like a uh, lego block you know the lego block is right lego lego is like combine them together to make some something right? it, but this one is not a lego so that you cannot just you know combine them together to make the individuals Living system has something to do with, it's different from the Lego. It's, it's more to do with how they 
should we make a total something and then it's not just a bottom up something but it's a there always like a top you know top down information flow that it just how to combine them nicely and then still there are some kind of secret and that's what we think is a uh, secret of the life so coming back to the Michael Levin's robot true that you know uh, once you want to make an indi individual maybe there is some sort of a uh, uh, a uh, third factor that exists, you know, it's not a Lego, but it's a Lego plus something that creates indiv individuals. That's something that we are looking for. So Michael Rabin is, is okay, but also some other systems, we really have to, we have to find the, the common kind of, of third factors, which creates, you know, uh, information from the top down that how to combine them together nicely so that you can make an individual uh, system. I don't know whether that makes it completely makes sense. You know, the, these living systems, they, they, they've got, they are chaotic, they have complex, they've got emerging uh, properties. And, and you're, you're saying that it, because I mean, your normal intuitive is intuitiveness is like, you know, it's life is like a Lego blocks because you, 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 yeah. you have these atom atoms and you kind of, you know, uh, you know, place them together. And eventually, I mean, you know, things would kind of form, but you're saying, no, there is something else. There's a third factor, which is, could be maybe that secret ingredient of life creation. Do you, do you have an intuition what the third factor is of what it could be of? So, so I think that is is, is kind of um, information flow that uh, very long time ago uh, Francisco Barrera and Matsurana tried to make a theory for what is life, what is the boundary, what is the self. It's, it's always like a philosophical ideas and we cannot say what this one is, but this is maybe some sort of information flow between the components, between the lower layer and, up, um, and, and the upper layers. And then we have to understand what this one is, but I have no idea about this one. Um, yeah, still, I, I, I try to figure out, you know, how to... Uh, but this one, so I call it Brooks Juice. You know, the Brooks, uh, Rodomini Brooks, you know, he is the father of um, uh, Roomba, the, the vacuum, vacuum cleaner, right? And then he said, um, he said, Takashi, so it's a robot and the uh, living system is still different, more complex a robot that we can make, but still, this is not life. We cannot deceive ourselves. So, what's the difference? And that's the same thing that we've been discussing, right? So, we have to find out what's the missing point, and then um, maybe um, computational power is is not a good enough to create real life, or maybe the model itself is not complex enough to become life, or maybe some parameter set because we tend to use like hundreds of parameters, right, or thousands of parameters. Maybe the parameter values are not uh, good, uh, not finely tuned. That's why the robot cannot become life. Or maybe there's some fundamental something that is missing still that we cannot find the life. So I call it, you know, uh, this missing uh, something is called Brooks juice. Once we put the Brooks juice, you know, on top of the robot, then the robot becomes life. But still cannot answer to your question of what is Brooks juice? I don't know. <laughs> Right, no, 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 fair enough. No, no. So, so now, uh, you know, I think some of the top uh, companies around the world are going for the holy, holy grail. You know, in creating artificial intelligence, they are working towards artificial general intelligence, where we go from narrow yeah. intelligence to possibly general, general intelligence. And there's companies such as OpenAI, DeepMind, Google, yeah. Meta, Microsoft. Everybody is yeah. racing towards that goal. You, 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 you have built out an Android, you know, Alter 3. Do, do, do you have an idea? I mean, what could be that uh, algorithm? What could be that architecture which could lead us to lead us towards a, a, like a artificial general intelligence? I think um, because I'm using a humanoid and then coupling with uh, uh, chat GPT-4, right? And then because the chat GPT-4 has not just learned uh, the corpus of words, but the how to use the words in what context they are, they are using, right? So this context and then uh, root, routines and social rules are also learned by um, 
by the chat GPT, right? So once you couple chat GPT with, with, language, uh, with Android, so that Android can do something without, you know, trained, without, you know, what, what do we call zero shot learning, without trained uh, intensively, they can do quickly what you can see, um, what you, you want Android to do. For example, like if I say pretend ghost, then he can pretend ghost even though, you know, Android never seen ghosts, right? Uh, well, you can say, you know, take a selfie, and then he can do take a selfie without, you know, um, any 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 training. And then also, it's not just like this this kind of thing, but also, you know, if, if I say to Android, you know, okay, suppose you are in the movie theater and you are eating popcorn, but then you notice that you are not eating popcorn from your popcorn, but you, you are taking popcorn from them somebody next sitting next to you right and so you got really upset can you do with with, with uh gestures and then he completely did this you know eating popcorn and he was so upset and then this kind of you know uh, gesture performance is possible without telling him what to do in in each time right so coupling with large language model can give him capability of behaving like human beings right uh, then I think uh, it's it's almost there, so that we can make a um, um, sort of a, uh, auto autonomy or what, what I call, or what I call you know autonomous agent within within Android, so that uh, if Android can spontaneously talk about something or speak about you know your uh, what what Android is going to do or what Android want to do, then Android is, you know, can can acquire a spontaneity, you know, without telling, without being told what to do, right? So that's the very the first step of the, the living systems emerges. So coupling uh, chat GPT or coupling a large language model with a humanoid like robot is, I think, it's, I think it's promising. So that's what we do have to have a humanoid uh, robot form style. Otherwise, chat GPT must be, you know, it, 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 they, they cannot tell robot what to do because chat GPT or large language model assumes that the living systems has two hands and two foot and then bodies like this. That's what uh, a big assumption of how to, you know, utilize chat GPT, right? So, right, right. And that's, that's the thing that I was thinking. Yeah. Right. right. So, so you saying an embodied AI, like a robot, yes. um, uh, AI. with yeah. uh, with coupled with uh, the statistical models, because you know at this point of time, Chat GPT they are statistical models. At this point of time, it's data yeah. in, data out. You know, but you're using something called a zero sort learning, so that you know it learns with the least data. Yes. What's your inkling? You know, when you you're talking about building these autonomous agents, is just data enough? Is just compute enough or do we have to do something what uh you know or we humans do you know because you know there's there, there, there is so much data at this point in time but it seems like i mean you know uh, though there is there are these papers which says that uh, there are emerging properties shown from these statistical models emergent intelligent properties you know shown from uh, the the statistical models large language models which are transformer based uh such as uh -huh. ChatGPT and others uh, is is just data data and compute enough or do we need something else because there with, with you know with humans we have obviously you know uh there is something i mean we, we have our brain we've got around 80 billion neurons 100 trillion synapses it fires and wires to give give out our five senses but there's something called as consciousness you know which gives us free will our own identity which we've got no inkling of uh, what what what's your intuition over there? I mean, do, do we need that, this something that, like a something like a Brooks juice over here to yeah. to go towards artificial general intelligence? That's a very interesting question, and I, I think it's very uh, uh, adequate and relevant. So I think um, um, emotion, emotional feeling, I and mean, is I think it's necessary because uh, the the very this uh, secret of why we can couple uh, LLM with my Android is because first the, the, the first prompt says, okay, why don't you just exaggerate uh, the given sentences into 
or uh, exaggerated emotional uh, expressions and the facial expression things too, right? So uh, if I say, uh, take a selfie, and then it, it's, it's translated into exaggerated face, facial expressions with uh, exaggerated body you know, expressions and things like that, then the body has a bunch of variations that changes the way that Android uses its, 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 its structures and body structures and body schema, right? So. I think um, emotion is a, a very nice way to um, become an interface between LLM and body embodied a robot. And Darwin has been, you know, Charles Darwin has been saying evolution of emotion is so important to, to understand. And then the question is why we don't hide emotional state from other people. Some, some of, most of us, you know, uh, emotion is is explicitly and then automatically expressed in our on our face and bodies, right? And this is, well, sometimes it's called honest interaction, honest signal that people can trust us or we can trust others. So this is catalyzing the way we interact with others, but not only in catalyzing the way we interact with others, but also language and body is catalyzed by those emotional feelings. So it's not just a computer with a logical, you know, uh, rules and processes. We need emotional and exaggerated something. And that is a very important cat catalyst, which we have to implement in the robot. So that's something that I think. Would you like to talk about your company, Alternative Machines, and some of the oh, works that you... Yeah. yeah, so the Alternative Machine, thank you so much. <laughs> so Alternative Machine is, uh, um, we try to sell, you know, life likeness in many things right for example like a uh the airplane that people make made an airplane by looking at birds and try to optimize how you can you know fly fast fast enough right but if you you know uh, look at the birds and the birds can fly but you know birds sometimes they uh, when they um, when they got, got tired they have to rest and when they are hungry, they want to eat something, so they sometimes going back, right? So people think it's a, if you mimic birds flying, then the, that such airplane is 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 you cannot trust it, right? However, the airplane sometimes crashes, but birds never crashes. Some well sometimes, but birds never crashes because the principle of birds is not to kill himself. You know, it's a homeostasis that birds is following. The homeostasis principle is necessary to for, for those airplane to to think about right when they are not uh, in a good shape they don't they shouldn't fly out right so that the birds can rest but in 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 a reality the airplane never get rest right because they don't understand what the uh, homeostasis is they don't understand what's you know when to rest right, by themselves so I think um, autonomous uh, machine under the principle of homeostasis is very important. And such kind of, you know, ideas should be sold uh, to, to the society. And then society must understand what the importance of homeostasis and then the properties of living systems. So that's what we sell, you know, to, uh, you know, to many companies, you know, even though they don't look like, you know, they nothing to do with, with the living system. However, maybe there are, comp there are, there are computers there are cars, you know, there are some other, uh, you know, like bicycles or uh, vacuum cleaners, all these kind of, you know, uh, uh, everyday tools can be autonomous and then it can be lifelike. Then that will change your life and then enrich your lifestyle. That's our idea. So that's why I started, okay. you know, we, I started my company and I tried to sell those spirit and then ideas. Right, and fantastic. I think I mean, in, in, in 
maybe the next few decades or so maybe things around us will be intelligent you know because anyway we are in the cusp of this uh, technological revolution where all the technologies are converging there's augmented reality virtual reality uh, mixed reality converging into you know creating these virtual worlds metaverse and spatial world and those worlds are becoming so realistic you know we we have these haptic feedbacks right. you know right. through which you can touch feel these worlds and there are these brain computer interfaces where through which you 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 eventually i mean it might go towards the space of more of like the magic mirror and matrix where possibly the the virtual could be uh, indistinguishable from the, uh, the 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 real world so i mean yes and like you pointed out you know building out i think in the next few years i think with with technology such as internet of things and digital twins maybe all the physical world around us could get intelligent and those 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 assets will help give us data to build predictive learning and so on and so forth your work yeah. is also on swarm intelligence can you uh, you know explain what swarm intelligence is and how can be applied to real world problems okay okay i think um my um, why i studied collective intelligence and swarm intelligence is because i think you know um our life ne- life likeness and then also our intelligence and then our you know uh, talent or our, our uh, you know uh, personal characteristics is coming from from others some people say oh i don't i don't have a talent but it's it's not true you know once you are in a community then your talent is sort of a contagious from others right uh, consciousness itself is a contagious i think it is coming from others so first of all you have to make a like aggregations like swarms you know maybe the swarms you don't have to pick up this one is good so we have to put in here this one is good you have to put it in it just a random swarming is is okay then because you know uh those interesting talents and property is is trans- is copied from one to the others the swarm is it just becomes a source of talent or or individuals right in the individuality and individual talent is is emerging from the swarm the swarm first of all you need a swarm a small community and these things then individual becomes in the real individuals and they have a very uh, uh strong individual talent and then that is emerging and then it is going out from the swarm so i think it's a swarm is so important intelligence the source of intelligence source of uh life likeness is from the swarm that's what i call swarm intelligence right right uh, can you share any recent updates or understandings from yeah. uh, your your laboratory or alternative machines yeah. that can uh, advance so, uh, these uh, learnings yes so i think um uh, uh, like 20 years ago the people think that the of a phenotype is generated from um uh, uh, rna through dna right i mean uh, dna from through rna but the expression of rna is so variable you know it's it's quite easily uh changed by you know interacting with others that's why this idea of you know uh, what my community first theory comes up because for example like um if you see a pretty girl in front of you your rna expression also changes rapidly right twice more uh, you know some proteins is generated so um we test we studied uh the clone uh, cells which is a tetrahymena is divided into 2 to 4 to 8 to 16 right and then i took a phenotype as a energy distribution of each each individual tetrahymena tetrahymena is like a, a small cd right it's like a protozoa right and then energy distribution is it's quite uh different from one to, i mean sometimes they have a very same energy distribution but sometimes this energy distribution is is different because once we take this individual then this one has a this type of energy distribution and this is inherited to the offspring when they are replicating and you have a different type of energy distribution they also inherited to the offspring so energy distribution can be um, one of the phenotype and then it's it's transfer to the offspring when they replicate but also because of the interaction within the community structures their distribution is also uh, changing again right 
So even though they share the same DNA, their phenotype is variable by the community structures. So, uh, I, and then I try to formalize what's going on there, right? What kind of interactions? And then I noticed that some of the cells are more, you know, uh, uh, self-determined its future, right? If you have a state like this, and then the next state in the future is determined mostly by the, by himself. But sometimes your future state is determined by not by you, but by others, right? So. So it's a auto, autonomous behavior, autonomous property is uh, community dependent. So that's something that I've been working on uh, using the real tetrahymena, try to understand what's going on by you know, using information theory and then also dynamic or systems approach. Professor, really, really appreciate you taking time and being part of the podcast. My last question to you, you are the incubator of AA Life Conference, you know, and, and you are the one who's kind of uh, taking this uh, uh conversation forward of artificial life. Do you have any advice to aspiring researchers who are interested in studying artificial life and complex systems? Uh, well, I think that to me, uh, science is to find uh, something, right? Explore the world, right? It's not just explaining something, but uh, explore the world. That's what science is about. And then other Artificial life is, you know, uh, even you, even within a computer, I mean, even without any ex experimental setup or anything, but you can always find something in your computer, in your small chemical systems or small, you know, ecosystems. Finding something new, you know, it, experimental mathematics, I, I call, is, I think, is what complex systems and artificial life is about. And this is how you can find what the secret of life is. What is life is only find, only can be found by, you know, experimental mathematics or, you know, like us, you know, how to synthesize life, not by, you know, using uh, living systems, but by, you know, information theory and then dynamical systems synthesizing, you know, within the computer. Maybe that's possible. And let's find uh, what the Brooks juice is. And that's our future. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Professor. I really, really appreciate you taking time and being part of the podcast. Yes, I think, you know, we need to keep on pushing forward and getting these answers because we live in a beautiful but mysterious world that the universe is so mysterious. And, and I, I think every little step that we take we get closer to not just understanding our environment, but also ourselves and who we are. And someday, hopefully, we will get to that brook juice. Till era, so wish you the very best. And to my listeners, if you like what you see in here, then please press the subscribe button. Until next time, see you guys. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Really appreciate this.